On Wednesday this past week, a group of us that had been uh, traveling to Israel as part of Calvary Church uh, returned home. We had a great trip. We were able, there's the group right there. Uh, We were able to spend some time together uh, going and visiting the sites that we've been talking about uh, in part through the book of Joshua. One of the great days we were able to spend was we started the morning in the wilderness. Uh, We then went to the Jordan River uh, and then we went to the city of Jericho where we saw archaeological evidence for the fact that uh, these walls had fallen down and that God had indeed given the people a victory uh, in that city. Well, that was a, an encouragement to us because when you go and you're able to do this, you see that these are not just stories, but this is a reality, that this is something that God has actually done. And he's left a record uh, of him being there and the work that he's done. Now, it was an amazing time. It was a great group. I do want to say that if uh, you're at all interested in doing this, uh, every year we do the same thing as we just sit down and we pray and we say, Lord, do you want us to go? Uh, That's in part because when the news starts to say that things are very dangerous, uh, we're able to say, okay, Lord, but we are going out of obedience. Uh, After all, it's not called the courage to obey if it doesn't take courage sometimes. And so we go because God is sending us in obedience. And so if you want to pray, we're currently praying about going in 2016. If you want to go, uh, all I'd encourage you to do is to begin to pray as well. Uh, And if God lays that on your heart, the great thing is if God tells you to go, he'll open the doors uh, and he'll make it happen and he'll provide the resources and all of the things. And so if you're interested, the best thing you can do is just simply begin to pray And as the Lord leads, uh, if we end up, uh, if he has us going next year and he wants you to participate in that, that would be fantastic. Well, one of the places that we go every year uh, when we go to Israel is to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is an important place uh, in the Bible. And so we go there and we have a chance when you sit on the Mount of Olives to be able to look out over the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. It's a beautiful view. Uh, Because we're not the only ones that go there, what you have on the top of the Mount of Olives is a number of different teaching areas. And that's because there's lots of tour groups that go through. And so uh, we were coming in the afternoon after having been in Jerusalem for the day. We were coming back to the Mount of Olives to sort of look uh, look over the city again and to kind of go through a teaching that Jesus did with his disciples uh, on the top of the Mount of Olives. Well, as we got off the bus, I just simply said, okay, well, we've got to find the seating area, a seating area, and we've got to, we're going to sit down and do some teaching again. I wasn't the first one off the bus, and so I wasn't leading us into the teaching area. And so when I got off, there were a number of them that were empty, that had no one in them. We didn't end up in any of those. We ended up in the one teaching area that had two or three people already sitting in it. In fact, there was actually maybe four or five. A couple were having a picnic and a couple were taking pictures and another uh, person was just sitting there, I think, enjoying the view. Well, we ended up in that section and too many people from our group had sat down for us to be able to move to another section. And so I thought to myself silently, oh, really? We've got other people here. This is going to be a distraction for me uh, as a teacher. Uh, But I did what I normally do when I start teaching as I drove people away. And so a number of them left. (laughs) but one couple ended up staying and they stayed through the whole teaching Uh, that's actually a picture of them that's Martin and Dana and they're from the Czech Republic and at the end of the time of teaching again I'm, I'm teaching our group but I keep looking over at this couple and they appear to be following along uh on their on their phones and uh Martin comes down afterwards and he says look I just want to say thank you Uh, they're born-again Christians from the Czech Republic. And uh, they were in Israel because Martin's a PhD student in computer science. And he had had come to Israel for education, for schooling purposes. But since they were Christians, they wanted to kind of go around the country and and see what they could see while they were there. The problem was they weren't part of a tour. They didn't know what they were doing, meaning they didn't know what specific sites were, what they were. They said, we just ended up on the Mount of Olives. And here they were having a little picnic dinner and we showed up and opened up the Bible and started to teach. And so he just said, well, I want to just come thank you. It was so great to be in a place with other Christians and to hear God's word being taught where we could just be here and listen. Well, 
uh, we just had a great time just kind of talking with them. And so one of the people in our group said, well, why don't we invite them to come have dinner with us at our hotel? So I was like, hey, you guys want to come meet with us? I think they thought that was awkward at first. But we, we said, hey, you know, this is Christian hospitality and, and, and none of us have homes here, but we have a hotel. We'd love for you to come and join us. So uh, Martin and Dana came to our hotel and we had dinner together and we were able to hear their story. Uh, Dana had only become a Christian maybe two or three years ago. And so she shared the story about how she became a Christian and Martin shared his story and we were able to hear about how Christianity in the Czech Republic uh, was going and we were able to share with them things about America and how things were, were going here and, and Calvary Church. And it was just a really fun evening to be able to be one together in the spirit. Well, uh, as we were leaving, they said, well, would you mind if we tagged along with you all tomorrow? <laughs> like, we don't really know anything about the city of Jerusalem, and we don't know what we're doing, and we'd love to hear more Bible teaching. So we're like, yeah, sure, come along. So they joined us. Uh, it was our last day in Israel, and so they came to a couple of the sites with us, came to lunch with us, uh, and then we left to get on a plane to come home. Well, as I was reflecting on this, on the fact that really, what are the odds that here would be this couple from the Czech Republic sitting in the one area on the Mount of Olives where we end up when we really, by reality, should have ended up in one of the other teaching sections, that we end up in this one area, that here are these new Christians who need help finding their way around Israel and being able to experience God in this place. And here we are having an opportunity to bless them and they have an opportunity to bless us. And as I reflected back on that, I thought, isn't that how God works? You know, we say, and it's true, that God was in the big picture of us going to Israel. Like in the whole big scheme of things, he was there. But he was also in the details of Martin and Dana being seated in that spot, our group coming there at just the right time to be able to meet with them and engage with them. And I love that about God. I love that when you look, if you're willing to look in the details, you can see the fingerprints of God at work. Well, that's what we want to talk about this morning. So please take a Bible and turn to Joshua chapter 14. Now, I've told you that the book of Joshua is divided up into two parts. The first half is Israel conquering the land. This is actually a fun read. It reads a lot like watching the movie Star Wars. There's lots of action. Lots of miracles, lots of really cool things happening. And you read the first 11 chapters and you're like, wow, this is sweet. The second half of the book of Joshua, that is about Israel allotting the land. Meaning uh, apportioning the land to particular tribes in particular ways and particular places. That's not quite as exciting to read. It's more like watching C-SPAN. There's a lot of sort of mind-numbing discussion and detail. But it is the Word of God. And God has promised that He will speak through His Word. And in fact, He tells us that in the Scriptures, the portions that we think aren't really about us are written for us. That everything in this is written with us in mind. So today we want to look in Joshua 14 and Joshua 15 where you are going to see a lot of mind-numbing sort of details, but we are going to see a passage of Scripture that God has written with us in mind. So look with me, Joshua chapter 14. Now these are the areas the Israelites received as an inheritance in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest... Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel allotted to them. This is the allotment of the land, and what we're told is, is that God, through Joshua, through Eleazar, and through the heads of the various tribes, allotted to each tribe and each clan and family within the tribe specific portions of this land. From this, we're going to get a detailed explanation of exactly what was allotted to whom. To give you an example of what this looks like, look in Joshua 15. Now, this is just for the tribe of Judah, one of the 12 tribes.
But here's the kind of detail that we're given. Verse 2. Their southern boundary started from the bay at the southern end of the Dead Sea, crossed south of Scorpion Pass, continued on to Zin, and went over to the south of Kadesh Barnea. Then it ran past Hezron up to Adar and curved around to Karka. It then passed along to Asman and joined the Wadi of Egypt, ending at the Mediterranean Sea. This is their southern boundary. Now, we still have to go through the northern boundary and the eastern boundary and the western boundary, and that's just for the tribe of Judah. But if if that wasn't enough detail, it continues in verse 21 where it starts to talk about all the different towns that were allotted to particular families and clans in Judah. To give you a sense of that, look in verse 33. Joshua 15, verse 33. In the western foothills... Eshtaol, Zorah, Ashna, Zanoa, Enganim, Tapua, Enam, Tapua, Enam, Jarmuth, Adulam, Soko, Azeka, Sha'arim, I think, Adithium, and Gedera, or Gederathim. By the way, if you don't know how to pronounce something in the Old Testament, just say it with confidence and keep going. <laughs> Fourteen towns and their villages. <laughs> Zenon. Hadasha, Midgaldat, Migdaldgad, Dilian, Mitzpah, Jokthiel, Lakish, Bozkath, Eglon, Kaban, Lamas, Kitlish, Gedaroth, Beth Dagon, Nama, and Makeda, 16 towns in their villages. And I think you get the point. But the question is why all this detail? Why not just stop Joshua 14, verse 1? Isn't that all the information we really need? that God, through Joshua and Eleazar the high priest and the heads of the tribes of Israel, allotted to each clan and each family the particular piece of land that was given to them. Isn't that it? Shouldn't that all we be? Isn't that all we need? Can't we just read a statement like that, period, and be done? I mean, after all, who really cares, for example, the town of Azekah? Who really cares that that was given to the tribe of Judah? Well, I'll tell you at least one group that cares. It's the people that were allotted the town of Azekah. Like the one family in the clan that was allotted the town of Azekah, when they open up Joshua 15, they get to read, hey, that's us. That's us because Azekah is a particular piece of land. It's a particular town. In fact, our group got to go there. Here's a picture of our group at the tell of Azekah, or the ruins of Azekah, we're sitting on top of the town that Joshua 15 is talking about. And in that particular place in Azekah, that particular place was given to a particular clan and a particular family in Israel. But not only that, that place has certain neighbors that go with it, certain neighboring towns. That means that those neighbors were also... The people who lived in Azekah were given particular people to be their neighbors. There's a brook that runs near the Tel of Azekah. There's a brook that runs near that place. That also was given to them by God. That place is a certain distance from Jerusalem. It's a certain distance from the Philistines who were their enemies. It's a place that gets a certain average rainfall per year. It's a place where a very famous battle in the Bible is going to take place. A battle between David and Goliath takes place just in front of the hill of Azekah. All of that was chosen for a particular family and a particular clan in Judah. And while you and I read Joshua 14 and 15 and we think, oh Lord have mercy, the the detail is overwhelming. For the people of Azekah, they're going to read this and think, that's us. We're in the Bible. We matter to God. God didn't just generally assign land to Israel. He assigned that particular piece of land to a particular family. But this isn't written just for the people of Azekah to be able to see their name written in the Bible. This is written for you and I. What is it that God wants to tell you and I this morning? It's this, that God is a God who blesses us in specific 
tangible, individual ways. That if he loves the family that ends up in Azekah enough to allot them a particular plot of land and to write that down for all of eternity in his word, that's the same God who loves you and I, who blesses us in the details of our lives. You see, it's easy to kind of get lost in the fact that God loves the whole world. That's true. I'm so grateful for that. But God also loves you. God also has arranged the details of your life and of my life. And sometimes if we think about the blessings of God in sort of vague generalities, like, yeah, there's some joy, I think, and some eternal life and some of those kinds of things, we miss the fact that God gives to each of us individual, specific, concrete, tangible blessings. In order to show you this, I want you to do an assignment with me. So please, if you don't already have one out, take out a piece of paper and something to write with. What we're going to do is there are a number of passages in the Bible which talk about how God blesses us in specific, individual, concrete ways for each one of us individually. We're going to look through just a few of those passages. And when we do, I'm going to ask you to write down specific examples of how this may have played out in your life. All right, got it? We start in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. Now this is speaking in particular about a socioeconomic situation and a situation within a particular family situation. And the idea is is that the socioeconomic and family situations in which you and I find ourselves is not random chance. They were specifically chosen for us by God and we were assigned the situation we're in and the family that we're a part of by God. So what I want you to do is on the piece of paper that you have, I'd like you to write down the address of where you live or where you're staying. Next, I'd like, you to, I'd like you to write down the names of some of your family members, could be spouse, could be children, could be grandparents, could be an aunt, could be an uncle, someone or some people that you are related to who have been a real blessing to you, a real blessing from God. Maybe there's a grandparent that's just been a huge blessing in your life. Uh, maybe your children, whatever it may be, a family member or members that have been blessings. Write down their names on that list. How about the name of the school you are attending or most recently attended, and I get for some of us, not very recent. The last school you sort of attended. Write down the name of that school on that piece of paper. You see, the school you attended, the family you're a part of, the house that you live in, the neighborhood that you live in, is all part of the socioeconomic family situation that you have. And you may think that you're there because you chose to be there, but what God is saying is is that that individual specific situation is something that he has chosen for you. 
Second passage, Matthew chapter 10. Jesus says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. What Jesus is telling us is that God knows the specific needs that we have. That God is concerned for us as individuals. Yes, it's true that God loves the whole world. Yes, it's true that God is concerned for everyone. But this passage says God is concerned for you. God is concerned enough about you that he knows and has numbered the very hairs on your head. I was talking recently with a woman who was thanking God for a new friendship in her life. As she described this new friend to me, she talked about how this friend had come into her life at just the right time, that she was needing some companionship, that she was needing somebody who could understand what she was going through, and this woman who God had brought into her life was in a very similar life situation that she was in, They're able to talk uh, confidentially about what's going on, both the joys and the pains. This other woman needs uh, what this woman uh, from our church could provide, and she was so glad to be able to serve someone else, to be a blessing to someone else while being blessed in return. That's an example of this passage. God knows that we need companionship. He knows that we need friendship, and he provides for us friends at just the right time. So what I'd like you to do on that piece of paper is I'd like you to write down the name of a friend that God provided for you, perhaps in the past, perhaps it's been a lifelong friend, maybe it's someone recently, that God provided for a particular time, a particular season as a way to bless you. Put down the name of a friend or friends on that piece of paper. Matthew 6, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Jesus is saying, God knows our financial needs. He knows that we have needs for food and for clothing and shelter. On a bigger picture, he knows every one of our financial needs. Not just generally, but our individual specific financial needs. I was talking to someone recently, and they were sharing with me a testimony about their Grace Beyond pledge. And they talked about how they had uh, prayed together as a family as to what they were supposed to give to the building project that we're going through. And as they prayed, God laid a number on their heart. As they talked about that number together, it was going to be a bit of a stretch for them, especially because their oldest child was heading off to university uh, for his first year in university. And they were nervous about the financial bills associated with paying for tuition. But still, they prayed and they asked God, and God had given them the number, and so they made the pledge, and they fulfilled the pledge. They began to fulfill it for this year. Well, their oldest child went off to university, and while he's at university, he was contacted by this secular university, and they asked him to apply for a scholarship that he hadn't applied for, didn't know anything about, and technically didn't qualify for. But he was the closest person at the university to qualify for. So they went through the whole university, I don't know, 25, 26, 30,000 students. Couldn't find anybody who qualified exactly for this scholarship. He was the nearest uh, qualifier. So the secular university called him and said, would you apply? So he applied, and guess what? He got the scholarship. 
And when he announced to his parents what the amount for the scholarship was, it was what they had pledged and more. And they rejoiced together. That's what this passage is saying. God knows that they need money for tuition. He knows the specific need. Look, going to university requires tuition to be paid. God knows that. He sees their exact financial situation. And he was blessing them in a very specific, tangible way. It's on your piece of paper. Is there a way in which recently you have seen God provide financially in a very specific way? Maybe it was a raise that you got at work. Maybe it was a Christmas bonus. Maybe it was a bill that you weren't looking forward to paying being waived. Maybe it was a generous parent or a friend coming along and providing a present or a gift. Whatever it was, is there a specific way in which you've seen God bless your particular financial situation? Not just generally God is generous, but right down on that piece of paper, Something. You can put down a number, you can put down a word, something associated with a way in which God has seen a financial need that you have and has met it or blessed you in a specific financial way. Romans 14, verses 2 to 4 say, One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. The good news about this passage is that God sees our individual struggles in the faith. That every single one of us has things that we struggle with, and mine are different than yours. What God is telling us is that He sees those struggles the areas in which we are likely to fall or will have a difficult time standing, and he provides specific ways to help us stand in those areas. Another passage of the Bible says, No temptation has taken you except that which is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out for you so that you can stand up under it. You ever wonder why that people who seem to say the first thing that pops into their mind, even if they end up hurting a lot of people's feelings, end up married to somebody who's good at telling them, stop doing that? (laughs) That's not an accident. You ever wonder why that people who struggle with self-control or with laziness or with organization often end up at jobs that require them to be self-controlled or organized? That's not an accident. You ever wonder why people who are tempted with lust or sexual immorality end up being drawn in to be part of groups that are good at accountability or willing to walk alongside of somebody in the midst of a struggle like that? That's not an accident. That's God fulfilling this promise, which is, I see your struggle. I know where you are weak, and I have provided means to help you stand. It's on that piece of paper. I'd like you to write down an area in which you struggle in the faith. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's laziness. Maybe it's gluttony. Maybe it's envy, whatever it may be. An area in which you find yourself to be weaker. And then I want you to write down anything that God may have done, a specific thing to help you stand in that. Did you go through a season of discipline where the Lord brought discipline into your life to teach you that the sin is going to, is going to harm you? Was there a passage of Scripture? Was there a friend that came alongside of you? What was it that God has provided for you to help you to stand in the face of that struggle that you wrote down on that piece of paper?
Romans chapter 12. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. That passage is talking about that each person who is a believer in Jesus has been given by Jesus specific abilities to bless others. That God has granted us individually spiritual gifts that allow us to serve and bless others. So on the piece of paper, I want you to write down what is it that God has made you good at doing in serving others. Has he made you good at teaching others? Has he made you good at showing hospitality to others? Has he made you good at praying for others? Has he made you good perhaps at playing music to encourage others? Has he made you good at organizing things for others? Has he made you good at showing mercy to others? What is that thing? You may struggle in lots of other areas, but you find yourself being good at encouraging others or helping others or leading or administering things. What's that thing that God has given to you that allows you to be a blessing to others? Write that down on that piece of paper. In John 21... Jesus says to Peter, Peter, you've got some suffering that's coming in your life. More than that, you're going to experience a difficult death. And Peter does what everybody does when we hear from God bad news. We turn to look at other people and say, well, what about them? Why are their lives so easy? And so Peter turns to John and says, what about him, Lord? Is he going to go through something as difficult as I'm going to go through? And Jesus kindly says to him, Peter... It's none of your business. It's between me and him. Just like your suffering, Peter, is between me and you. And the point is, is that God has chosen for Peter and for each one of us a cross to bear. And that somehow part of God's individualized blessings in our lives, they're associated with the individualized sufferings that we go through. And so what I want you to write down on that piece of paper is, what's the road you've currently been asked to walk by the Lord? Or what's a suffering that God has allowed to come into your life? Is it cancer? Is it the loss of a loved one? Is it loneliness? Is it struggling with depressive thoughts and feelings? Is it a financial uh, difficulty that you're in the middle of or have gone through? What is that suffering that you have been asked personally by God to be willing to walk down? And what provisions has God given you along the way to help with that? I heard of a person in our church, a student who's in a secular university and she's being persecuted for her faith. The professor knows that she's a Christian purposely uh, making life more difficult for her because of her answers to the kinds of things, the kinds of questions that are being asked in the class. That's a hard road. That's not my road currently. That's the road she's been asked to walk. That's the cross she's been asked to, to, to bear. The testimony, though, did include the fact that at Calvary, some people have come alongside of her and are praying for her and encouraging her. And that whatever grade she ends up getting in the class or however that ends up going, uh, that they're with her to walk alongside and to bless her. What's the particular suffering that God has asked you to walk down? And what's a, perhaps a way in which he's shown you grace in the middle of that? Well, we could go on. These are just six passages from the Bible. We could go on many, many more times over. But what I want you to do right now is take that piece of paper and I want you to look at it. Look back over the answers that you wrote down. Look back over the things that are there.
names of family members, names of friends, names of ways God's blessed you financially or helped out financially, spiritual gifts that he's given you. Now, if we were going to do this, and we're not, if I was going to ask you to take that piece of paper and hand it to someone else, to them that piece of paper would read like Joshua 14 and 15. It would be filled with what appears to them to be mind-numbing detail. Who really cares about this address? Or I don't even know this person's name. Or I don't even know what this number here means. But to you, it represents the specific, individual, tangible blessings of God for you. That God is not just concerned with the people who live in the town of Azekah. That that same concern, his eye is on the sparrow and I know that he watches me. That that same concern that God is willing to write down for all of eternity in the word of God. That clan gets that piece of land. These are the blessings that I have allotted to them. Not general sorts of blessings of hope, peace, joy, and love. Thank God for those. But in specific, concrete tangible ways God is designing for you and for me a list of blessings and you may share that with someone else and they may read it and their eyes may glaze over they may fall asleep but to you it is the living testimony that God loves you and that God is not too concerned with billions of other people to forget about you he is mindful of the situation that you are in he sees you he knows the number of hairs on your head he gets concerned for you. He knows the bills you have coming. He knows the situation that you are in. And this God loves you. The same God who went to all this trouble, not just to generally give a piece of land to a people, but to specifically choose each family, each clan, each person and give them a piece of land is the same God who sees you and has designed for you individualized, specific, tangible, real blessings. I encourage you to go home and keep filling out that list. No one else is going to want to read it. But to you, It is the evidence of a loving God who is providing in amazing ways. We're in the Christmas season. We see this very point played out in the life of Mary. When God assigns her the role of giving birth to the Messiah, Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Because he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Mary is saying, God has designed a life for me. It's a life that includes some suffering and some struggles. But it will ultimately be a pathway to blessing. And where you and I look at Jesus, and we see what he means to us to Mary... He's a very specific, tangible, concrete blessing from God to her. And the good news is, he is that to each one of us individually as well. I'm so grateful that God so loved the whole world that he gave his son. But I'm also grateful that the good shepherd calls us individually by name. And says to us, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to bless you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. A God who says through Jesus, I know the number of hairs on your head. I know what you need. I know what tomorrow is going to bring. I know the cross you've been asked to bear. I see you. And I will bless you. Let's pray together. Lord, who are we that you are mindful of us? Not just humanity in general, but me and each person in this room. Lord, 
what was written down on these pieces of paper. They'd be boring to the rest of the world, but they're glorious to us and they're beautiful to you because they are the record of our story that you are writing. May you receive all of the praise and honor and glory. Amen.